So, you, you, you comfortable? Yeah, I'm good. Good. Uh, yeah, thank you for having this conversation with me. Um, uh, uh, just to um, give it some context, this whole series is really an excuse for me to speak to some interesting people and just have a, have a genuine conversation. Um, and I obviously I spoke with Teresa Chung uh, on this series and she also spoke with you and then connected us um, because I had seen uh, the film Holy Hell on Amazon, mm-hmm. which is about a spiritual group, cult maybe, uh, that you were part of, a very, very good documentary. And uh, you had mentioned my work to Teresa. So she thought, oh, I must connect these two people. And she did, which is, and, and here we are. This is the first time we've really spoken apart from on email. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm very glad she did. I'm, I'm as well. I, um, some people, I call it a cult. <laughs> some people that were in the group call it a spiritual group. Uh, like, eh, you know, <laughs> uh, this or that. But um, yeah, I was a part of that community for many years. Um, in the film, they have to have a uh, through narrative. So um, everybody left at the at approximately the same time uh, when the letters came out and the secrets started coming out about the guru. Um, <clears throat> but I had left like six months beforehand um, because I I was able to, I was the guru's personal massage therapist. So I had a lot of uh, personal interaction with him and it just felt like this isn't an integrity. And, you know, there are too many lies. There are too many, you know, this. And, and I was like, I, I can't do this anymore. Um, so in some ways it was easier for me because I left on my own. And, um, and so when it all fell apart, I had my own autonomy. Uh, but in some ways it was harder because when I left, everybody that I knew that I was still close to was in the group. Yeah. Um, and then what happened was I, uh, I went off to Hawaii and um, I was doing a different sort of spiritual work. It was something that somebody had introduced me to called Pathwork, which was all about really diving into your shadow self, like... Um, Kind of Jungian in nature, and uh, and then I randomly went to a bookstore because uh, I needed a book, and I um, saw the Laughing Jesus and said, "What's this?" and I bought it, and uh, I loved it so much that I ended up buying fifty copies on wholesale and started leading like not what we called uh, Gnostic gyms and we would sit around and drink wine and discuss Gnostic philosophy because I was just like this I when I read the book I was like uh, oh he's expressing thoughts that I had that I didn't know that I had you know that um, it was it was just a it was it was brilliant so thank you for that. A, a, well, a I, I, I couldn't be more del- course of my life. Well, well, how lovely. What a lovely thing to be able to say. And, and I'm, I'm very moved to hear that, Greg. And, and yeah, it's, it's lovely when a, when a book makes a real impact. And I'm very pleased it's led to here. So I yeah. was thinking, I was thinking um, you know, because in, the way that I've approached this is, is, to, is to make it a conversation around, you know, what the hell's happening, <laughs> you know, what's going on. And I thought it'd be interesting to maybe explore with your experience, what you thought was going on and what you think might be going on now. And also because just to put my cards on the table, I, I not in, in the dramatic, you were in for quite a long time, weren't you? Decades, is that right? Um, I joined when I was 21 and I left when I was 34. Okay, all right. I've been I've actually been out of the group longer than I was in the group at this right, point. Right, right. So I I I was 
uh, I think arguably I've probably been, I might have been in three cults, but not for anywhere near as long. Um, mm -hmm. One of which was very, very, very big. And so I was a tiny, tiny thing within it. One of which was very, very small. So I was very important within it. Um, one was quite different, but, and, and we're talking about a few years, perhaps each time. Uh, but I do have some experience with it and I could see resonances in what you were experiencing in the film, which I thought was very good. And it kind of brought up a lot of stuff for me around what the hell was that and, and how careful I am around spirituality because of it, how, you know, and, and, and because, you know, people I introduced are still in it, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and how that feels, all, all of those contradictory things. So I thought it'd be fascinating to try to explore a bit of that, see if it may make any sense of it. Yeah, well, I, I know I've read uh, uh, How Long Is Now, and um, and you were talking about your spiritual experiences as, as a child. <clears throat> and I had, uh, you know, not the same experiences, but when people would ask me after they'd seen the film, go like, how could you follow that guy? He was so creepy, he was so this or that. Um, the things that we were doing as practices in, uh, in the Buddha field, I had actually discovered on my own as a child. Like I started playing with my third eye when I was in detention one day and I was like, oh, what's, and I was like, oh, there's this, and you could, I could do it with a pencil. I could do it with, and some people could feel that energy of, and even if it wasn't touching your third eye and some people couldn't, like my mother couldn't. So, and, um, and I had aunts and uncles that were into TM and into um, uh, uh, Kriya Yoga. So the idea of a guru uh, wasn't foreign to me. It was just like, um, uh, it was just a thing that you did if you wanted to try to get closer to uh, God, for lack right. of a better word. Right. So you were already, you're primed for it. Yes. Yeah, I was primed for it. And then we also used to do a bunch of open eye meditation Mm -hmm. um much like uh that video you just posted yeah i also discovered that when i was a teenager it was yeah. so like the practices were like innate in me before i got in um and what would happen is that um you're surrounded by people who you respect and are close to and everybody would keep everybody else in line. So if you started feeling like, um, oh, that's weird, or that's that doesn't seem like it was an integrity or this or that, or that doesn't seem like a good decision, then there was the, the constant trope of like, well, if you're right and the guru is wrong, then you're wrong because the yeah. guru yeah. sees and yeah. you need yeah. to, you know, surrender your mind and drop did your you, mind. Did you have the mind the whole one? So there was a lot of, so the thing I got into when I was young, and I'm thinking I must've been 17 because I couldn't drive because my parents had to take me and my friends was what was then called the Divine Light Mission, uh, Mirage, um, which it looked like your guy had taken a whole load of stuff from. Oh, you, you, you know who he stole from? I, I didn't realize it until um, I watched Wild Wild Country. The, oh, from Bagwan? The, from, yeah, from Osho. Osho, and, yeah. Yeah, and... Um, but there was also some things with the light. That was all, mm -hmm. that's all, I mean, I, we could, there's lots of sources, but that's, that was Miraji's whole trip. But what, mm -hmm. what, what I can remember, and so, so and what I'm wondering is, did you have to work at it? Because what, I, what, I, what intrigues me is that, when I looked at Andreas, is, is, is yeah. your guy, is that one of his many names? Yeah, that's and, one of his many names, yes. And uh, it's like, you know, obviously you're working a documentary, you know it's called Holy Hell, but nevertheless, from the minute he appears, there's all these lovely looking people having really beautiful experiences, a little bit, you know, out there, but really attractive, and this creepy guy. Mm -hmm. And it's so obviously a creepy guy, I suspect everyone watching it, apart from those in, in it, are going, 
why are they, why can't they see this creepy guy? And then I remembered going along, so Miraji, when I was 17, would have been probably himself only 19. So mm -hmm. he was young and he was, you know, all around the world and the stuff. So there was just a photo. And, I, and, and going to this environment with these premies, as they were called, lovers, and it was all weird, you know, it's like they drunk weird tea and they sat on the floor and I'd never seen anything like it in my life. And there on the wall was this creepy looking guy, younger, <laughs> but really creepy. And my feeling instantly was, whoa, he's a creepy looking guy. Why are all these people treating him as, as if he's the Lord of the universe? Mm -hmm. But within weeks, months, definitely weeks, I thought he was the Lord of the universe. Yeah. And, 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 but he didn't even just end there. I had to work at it. And when I went to see him the first time in a big festival, I wanted to feel what everyone else was feeling. So I was like, oh, we're with him, we're with him. And I wasn't feeling it. So I had to work at it to make myself feel it like everybody else. And then I did. And then I mm -hmm. could feel it whenever I wanted to feel it. And that was really intriguing me thinking about that. So did you have that at all? Did you, did you instantly did go, that. wow, he's, he's it? Or did you have some? So I, um, I met a satellite group um, uh, in Phoenix and that's when I joined uh, the group and I got a girlfriend who I was, I'm still close to uh, and we dated for six years. Um, but I didn't meet the guru uh, for, I was in the group for a year and a half, oh, uh, right. maybe yeah. years. And then we, everybody moved to Austin, all the, all the splinter groups got brought back in. And I remember um, that I fell in love with the people. Yeah. And with the guru, I was like, well, I'm not sure. I've, I've never called him my guru. He's never said, I'm, you're my disciple. I don't, I, I'm not so sure about this, but there's all this love and there's all these beautiful people. And um, yeah, yeah. And the, the power of um, the power of people that you respect and care for telling you, no, this is, this is the, the way. So I, I did, you know, come to um, be quite devoted, you know, and yeah. I worked on them every day, every single day, 365 for years. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, but that that close proximity to him is what uh, led me to walk away. You know, had I been um, why did it take you so long? Uh, what's that? Why, why did it take you so long? Um, well, the first few years were really beautiful, and um, the middle few years there were there were peaks and valleys. And then I was getting deeper into the inner circle and mm. it just felt more and more oppressive until I finally just had to say, okay, well, I might be in my mind. I might be missing my chance at enlightenment, but I've got to go. I can't, I can't do this anymore. Um, it was actually, he was a very controlling person. And uh, the, the final straw for me was um, my mother was dying of cancer and uh, he wanted to control when and how often I went to go visit her. And, and I was struggling with that. And I know somebody that made that decision um, based on his recommendations and never got to like see her father who died, but it was tearing on me and I finally, had a moment of realization where I was like, I am responsible for my own life and I'm going to feel like an asshole yeah. for the rest of my life if um, I don't go. And, you know, my mother is dying. I'm her only child. That's the one thing that she wants most in the world is for me to come out regularly. And I, was, and I, I had been leaning out, but that was kind of my final push out the door, like, no, I'm, I'm responsible for my life. I'm, I, I, I can't do this anymore, you know? And, um, 
And so I walked away and I was in Hawaii. And then all of a sudden I started getting phone calls from everybody saying, everybody's leaving, everybody's leaving. That's, you know, yeah. I didn't actually know that he was um, uh, doing all of that sexual abuse. Like right. we all knew that he was gay, but he presented it as though he had transcended sex. And he was like, there's nothing wrong with sex, but once you get to the great spiritual heights that I have, uh, it's like a sneeze, you know? So, you know, you need to focus more on God. And so we, at least I thought he had transcended his desire for sex, but I later found out uh, from people that he had um, coerced into uh, having sex with him that he had tried to put me through the same regime. Like he had a several step plan and he would try to sexually isolate you and he would try to break me up with my girlfriends and try to convince me that I was gay. And that was, he had a whole routine, but he never um, got all the way there. So to the point where um, he was actually directly trying to have sex with me. So I didn't, I didn't know, I think, you know. I, do, you, do you, did you have a period or are you still angry about what happened? Um, I don't really have any anger about it now. When I came back and I found out what had been going on and how I, I then I became angry, you know, yeah. because I was, I was also ostracized from the community. So he was trying to, yeah. uh, when you start to leave, he would try to pull you back in. And if he thought that he couldn't pull you all the way back in, then he would push you out. Um, and you know, and you were kind of an outcast. But fortunately I had um, several close friends that um, just weren't going to cast me out. And uh, yeah, th that was helpful. Um, so, uh, it's, uh, he was a magnetic person, even though he was weird, he was a magnetic person and, um, and we were creating, there, there were, you know, a hundred plus of us and, uh, it was like we were creating an energy field. It wasn't necessarily about him. It was about um that collective energy so i had a conversation with andrew cohen um not in this series or anything he, i did a, an event with him he asked me if i'd do an event so i did an event which, as long as i could discuss all of this which we did and it was it, it was fact what i wanted to do is because i talked to people who were on the other side of a cult but never the person who was actually the center of it apart from mm -hmm. what i was in and that was full on and speaking to people about their experience there and that same thing and 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 you can see that i didn't have this so much because i wasn't well maybe i did in one of them is this kind of like something great happened is like it's like something awful but something great also mm -hmm. and something you look back and you think but i gained a huge amount from that as well yeah and then yeah. you know but then gained gained, <laughs> gave me even more from getting out and and that's and the other thing Great, which really strikes me is that I, I have this, my experience of life generally is that it, 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 it can become very magical, very dreamlike. And what the place I've ended up understanding that is that that's a completely natural part of what existence is. And nothing, and it's kind of amoral. It's, it doesn't, it just happens. And it happens just as much in a pernicious cult as it does in something really benign and, and and it's kind of just happens it's just the nature of life and and my suspicion is that you know it happened at the nuremberg rallies and it happened with people when they were that the, and so what my memories with all of the things i was in as a, as a kid was you felt like the universe was going yes because these amazing things would happen really amazing totally blow your mind amazing in fact the further in you get the more you enter that sort of magical state the more they would happen yeah, when you were saying that, it made me think, um, like, 
some of my most ecstatic moments were just moments of intense synchronicity where you're like, there is no way that that just happened without yeah. some, some coordination with yeah. something there because there's there's no way that that person should have been at the airport like my yeah. Yeah. cousin standing in the wrong terminal trying to pick somebody else up and uh, you know and he's the one person that i wanted to see and um i asked him hey can you you know i want to see you and he was like ah, i can't make it um and then i get off the plane and all of a sudden I hear, hear, hey, Greg, and I turn around and it's my cousin that I'd wanted to see. And I was like, hey, oh, good to see you, let's go. And he was like, oh, I'm not here to pick you up. He was there to, he would at the last minute um, gotten uh, off of work and uh, drove up to get his girlfriend that was coming in at that exact same time. But he was actually standing in the wrong terminal. <laughs> So it was like how there there had to be so many like and and he had to notice me as I was I wasn't looking for him you know and just saw me out of the crowd as I was and and in that moment I was like oh you know I've had lots of those moments where I'm like yeah there's yeah, some lots of sort of coordination happening on some level that I don't understand but and that, and there. that's when I think when you, if you get I mean you know and, and like you and some are just you know. It, just outrageous i mean just just absolutely crazy there was one time when i was uh living in a bedsit with a dear friend we were both into this guru um we both wanted to go and see him in um somewhere rome or wherever he was i just scraped enough money together my friend didn't have it and it had to be that day and and you know it was just I, a check arrived in the post hmm. which i shouldn't have been sent for exactly the amount of money for me to give it to him so he could go now now if you've then got in your mind all of this is the guru's grace and he can see everything <laughs> it's very easy and that's where it feels like ah that's why it's become important to me to understand to me there's too, i've had that happen too many times something is going on it's yeah. just not the way i understood it yeah and not understanding what's going on can lead you to all sorts of problems and can be hijacked by somebody who, yeah. who wants to make it I, about I them. totally agree. Um, there was a lot of talk about the guru's grace. The, the one thing I, I will say that being in that group and constantly, the intention was to always be present to your third eye at all times. Like, so formal meditation, but when you were in your day-to-day -day walking life, you were also supposed to be meditating. And that, um, you know, you're stimulating your DMT um, uh, producer. And so life um, you would take on more of a magical quality and you would notice like yep. those little moments. Yep. But, uh, uh, you know, the whole notion that it, it came from the guru's grace is... Um, is silly at this point you know i came i came like with with um talking to to andrew cohen and and looking at what happened with his group and just generally and especially with the one i've been in it just felt it now feels to me that there is a particularly pernicious triangle of ideas which i embraced wholeheartedly which are come from india um mm -hmm. which i now think are really bad news and 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 they work together which is the idea of enlightenment that there's some place and that it's a it's a place where you see through the illusion and escape that what is trapping you is your ego or your mind your ability to think for yourself and mm -hmm. the only person therefore who can free you is someone outside who's already achieved this state and that's the guru and those three things work together i think to create cults which is why it seems that in india is full of cults and always has been that the the and and a lot of us very naively took it on we, we, because it was exciting. We knew no better and because powerful experiences were happening. Um, yeah. But actually, and, and the, you know, it's, it's fun hearing you say about the mind because that's when I can remember. I can remember at the point where I was, go, was doubting it. I actually was involved twice, once left and went back. Mm -hmm. And quite a few years later for another period, short period. 
but when I was again doubting it, I'd. Um, here's a synchronous let me just tell you this. you'll find, probably find it interesting just because it'll resonate with you this is what i mean by the kind of magic the way that life is just magical sometimes if you enter that state so i can remember when i was in it having a dream about miraji which was the best thing i could imagine because i mm -hmm. about miraji and i'd be completely blissed out and i was at a, a big program that he was organizing and i was outside and he drove up in his rolls royce uh, this is a big thing, obviously, he was doing. Rolls Royce came out, kind of, he, he would float along, walk very fast, and he just turned and looked at me, and I was in bliss in my dream. And then about six months later, I volunteered to do the sound at this big program that was running. And, and actually, I was just full of doubt. I was just, this is wrong, this is bad. And when I would express it, people would go, that's your mind, stop listening to your mind. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. I'm trapped. You, you, you can't listen to the very thing which is telling you get out what you do. And then the program has, it was, the, it was the next day and I was outside just, just waiting. And then just like the dream, the Rolls Royce pulls up. Never been like that with him because it's such a big thing. He steps out, walks in, and turns to look at me. But what I actually feel in real life is who the hell are you? Hmm. And it was such a strong feeling of who are you? And from that moment, it kind of all, it was, it was I'll tell you the other one, and this made me think of your guy with his dancing and all of that, was that it was that there was one big program where Miraji decided he'd written, start writing poetry. And he read some of his poetry and it was so bad, especially for someone. <laughs> the image. I mean, it was such bad, bad poetry. And at that point, I just thought there's nobody near him going, uh, not, not the yeah. poetry. <laughs> you know, just there's nobody there to tell him. And so in front of thousands and thousands of people, he's reading out this dreadful poetry and mm. everyone's going, oh, isn't it great? <laughs> Oh, it's, yeah, that is such a similar experience. Uh, <laughs> actually, but I think I think you put it well. I don't. Um, I think it was in how long is now that it's. Um, we have to embrace and in both that we, you know, life is um, suffering if we only identify with our mind. But you know, we need a mind to like, I think you said something along the lines of, would we really love to be, like to be in a world where our children aren't attached to us and we've lost all sense of attachment and we're just, uh, yeah. Um, so I've, I've tried to embrace that um, no reality without duality sort of thing in it. And, and <clears throat> Like when people talk about um, uh, is life predestined or is it free will? Um, why can't it be both? Why, why can't it? I, I think that maybe it's just our limited capacity to grok that in its fullness. You know, it's, it's maybe it is. Um, Maybe we shouldn't say, well, it's either got to be hot or it's, it has to be cold, you know, <laughs> maybe we just don't understand it, but there's, there's some, it's happening both simultaneously. I, I certainly get that with the, with the mind. It's like, you know, it's like, and, and, and I don't, that seems obvious to me. It feels like, look, I love the mind. I love your mind. I love sharing minds. I love thinking with minds and I would love the stillness and I love the quiet. And why would you not have time for both of those? Mm -hmm. um, but that undermining of the ability to, well, it's the undermining of the self, really, isn't it? It's the, I think that's, that's why I've ended up so personally, I've ended up very, very pro the individual. And mm -hmm. for me, my, in my latest work, it's about wanting to see a transition from an individual to a, a individual, as I call it, which is an individual conscious of unity. So that rather than the unity experience arriving by getting rid of the individual it's like the the the, the completion of the individual it's mm -hmm. it's when you've in, you individuated enough in Jung's sense then it's possible to sustain more these unitary states and the individual doesn't go 
In fact, that, you know, you still remain, you know, it's like, well, no matter how much I've experienced, I'm still just Tim. And, mm -hmm. and that's okay. And Tim's growing and learning and getting old and realizing what an idiot he's been and, and all, of, you know, and hopefully getting a bit wiser through that. And these states are much more accessible than they've ever been. Um, but the individual feels like that ability to, like you did, to just go, this doesn't feel right to me. And I owe it to my mum, my mother to do this and, and those unique relationships. And that feels so important. And yeah, that, that, that losing that, and that's what, that's what I find so distasteful about the whole cult thing around where somebody takes it away. So that, I mean, my, when I do events, I just want people to walk away empowered for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and, and I love it when people are like, when we're in a group, when people go around and they will thank me, but they'll thank everybody else as well. And it's like, yeah, great, because we're together. Not that kind of a, what makes someone do that? It must be so lonely and horrible, actually. He, uh, well, the guru obviously has narcissistic personality disorder. Like yeah. it's, it's just yeah. apparent. I didn't realize it at the time, but you, you, um, I wanted to show you something that I've been working on for a couple of years. And it was uh, what made me think about it when you said Jung, there was a psychologist that I had studied for a while and he broke down the 16 uh, Jungian archetypes into four archetypes uh, based on two questions. And you get a, you know, maps are not um, real things, but good maps are, good maps and exactly you can right I agree with you about on both the nature of some how somebody processes the world with those two questions and and uh, doing that and so I started thinking about that as it relates to spirituality and um and I, I think I've I'm going to debut the chart <laughs> I mean I literally have I've I've been working on this uh, because the cross section is the hardest one, but I think that there, can you see this? I can. Yep. Uh, yeah. I'm going to put myself on the big screen so I can see what I'm pointing to. So, um, G, yeah, A, G, so, A, T, and T. Yep. Uh, so Gnostic. Yep. Agnostic, um, atheist and theist. And what separates, um, uh, on, on the one section is, um, can you know? And the theists and the atheists both know what happens to you when you die, you know, because the theist, whatever theism that you like. Um, and then the atheists also know because duh, science, stupid. Um, and then you've got, um, and then that separates the Gnostics and the agnostics. And then the, the second question is, um, do you believe um, that you are interacting with anything outside of yourself energetically? So like, uh, even if you believe in the secret and the universe is going to give you everything that you want or you experience the awakening of synchronicity or, or whatever it is um the that takes you if you if you believe that you're you are experiencing something else um then that's the gnostic theist and if you don't think that there's any point to interact to reaching out to the universe then you're an agnostic or an atheist. So those are those are the the four quadrants, and I think um, it's it's a little tricky with that definition because um, you know Gnostic is um, I'm preaching to the person who taught me all of this, but the Gnostic also knows that he can't know that there's no ultimate knowing that there isn't, um, but there is something there what that is it can't be defined whereas the agnostic is like well i don't know if there's anything there um <laughs> and i don't really you know what's the point like i'll find out when i die so there's no searching 
and I think those are the four quadrants. And uh, yeah, That's what do you really, think? Uh, yeah, no, it's interesting. It's interesting. So the first question was, give me the two questions again. Um, can you uh, know what happens to you when you die? Yep. And the Gnostics and the Agnostics say, no, you can't know. Yep. Theists and the atheists say you can. Yep. And then um, the, the cross question, I guess I've, I've, I've tried 50 different combinations and it's still a little awkward because um, like it's a little wordy for, um, but are you interacting with energies outside of yeah outside like you, you can meet an angry person and that's but you know <clears throat> that, 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 that second question in particular was, was was interesting because literally just over the last few days i've been with this with project i'm working on at the moment i've been thinking i really can't define spirituality what i mean by it even and that's a bit of a problem, <laughs> but given that that's what the center of what I'm, I'm doing um, and, and where, I've, where I've ended up, and I haven't tried this on anyone, so I might backtrack on it very quickly, but um, it, the, the word I ended up with is a word I never use, which was the word supernatural, um, but done in a very literal sense. It just felt, yeah, it's to do the thing, because what is it? You know, there's awakening, there's, Jesus, everything. I live in Glastonbury, it's a little town it's like living in a little cult really and uh that, you know, wait, 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 i have to stop you for a second that might actually be i've been trying to find the more elegant cross question um can you experience the supernatural i think that's a more yeah elegant question. yeah I, I think it might be i think that's yeah. it because it's it's supernatural it's not it's, you know, there's the natural world, and especially because more and more, now that materialism has collapsed, and then the people became physicalists, and now that's collapsed, and I hear more and more people who, who, who adopt that view, who call themselves naturalists, natural philosophers or naturalists, and it feels like, yeah, so, so it's, that, it's that feeling of that, that intuition and experience of, yeah, there's all of this, and there, mm -hmm. is, there is more, and that's a reality, that's not just some sort of passing fantasy. Hmm. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> so, so it, it, in all of this, Greg, you don't seem to have become cynical. I, I, I didn't become cynical, but I can imagine it must be very easy to be cynical. Did you have a cynical period? Uh, and I really understand I people. Who are. I, I have zero desire to. Um, uh, ever follow a guru again um, <laughs> yeah me too <laughs> um but yeah as i said I, I think in some ways um it was easier for me because i i had autonomy when i left and it wasn't like i'd been in the group for 25 years and all of a sudden a bombshell um, comes out and everybody and then people are like oh my god I've wasted my life on this charlatan and this is not what I thought and those people like there were people uh, I know directly in the group that had nervous breakdowns and had some real anxiety issues uh, around the whole thing how many uh, how many people are we talking about in this um, the group usually floated around 100 to 125 people and um, occasionally people would leave and occasionally a few people would come in. Um, the group I was in, you had to like, um, it, it wasn't as big as uh, the organization that you were talking about because you had to like, you had to prove your uh, bona fides of being devoted and like it was secret and he, he was, you know. Uh, that, that, that was the same. I think that's part of stuff, some of the stuff he might've taken. I mean, to get the, you know, so ironic, you know, I did all that stuff on Gnosis, um, but I think you had the knowing, well, it was the, the, yeah. the knowledge. So you received yeah. the knowledge and had a direct experience. And, and there would be phases when you could get the knowledge very, very easily. And I came along just to the point it was really, really hard. 
So I, mean, mm. I, I, I went on a special little groups and we had instructors, or Westerners or Indians would come and put you through things. I can remember being told, you know, unless you wanted knowledge more than breath, Mm. and you know I, gee, I, gee, I mean I was a little boy really I was you know 17 or 18 I was meant to be go my parents god bless them were taking me and my girlfriend to go to Stratford upon Avon to, to watch some Shakespeare plays and mm -hmm. then I was offered the chance to go and get the knowledge and I just mm. abandoned them I just mm -hmm. went I just said look god wants me to go and get the knowledge what can I do and mm -hmm. the three of them my girlfriend and my parents <laughs> went off to these plays and I went off and was and, and I had to wake up, this was, in, it was in February, and I had to wake up in the middle of the you know, morning and go running into the sea to show how desperate I was, you know, this freezing sea to show you know, mm. how much I wanted this knowledge. And yeah. yeah. And then I didn't even get it, not then. <laughs> I did later, but not then. <laughs> I still wasn't ready. <laughs> Yeah, you know, dude. Uh, I, I, I never saw him again after I left because I went to Hawaii. The group dissolved. He traveled and left the city and um, is now on a different island in Hawaii. Um, where was I going with that? Um, apparently, I, I talked to people and he hadn't had any knowing sessions for a long time but as people started dropping left and right he started like oh i'm going to share just he was trying to yeah yeah bring you know i'm going to now give you the secret that i have been holding back from you for 15 years in order to try to manipulate people to stay yeah i feel bad like when i did the movie um, because I found out uh, he had started to reconstitute the group. Yeah. And I was like, well, if I had known what was going on, I never would have uh, joined. And it's kind of my responsibility to talk about it because, you know, if not me, then who? Um, but the, the people that knew what was going on and moved with him to Hawaii, I find partly culpable because if he just goes to Hawaii by himself yeah. and he doesn't have people sitting around fawning at him, um, that's, that's what creates the thing where other people are now that are looking for some sort of spirituality or like, Oh, look at that person! Everybody's sitting around silently around so, him. So, so I'm. This is this is just completely just made this up completely, and it could be completely wrong. But what I'm what I'm imagining is, my, you know, what I saw was that once you've made one person the thing, it's how close you are to them that counts. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's you're special yourself by reflected yeah. light. So yeah, people, I, I was in the inner circle. It was it was definitely I definitely climbed the ranks of the social ladder because yeah. I saw him every day. Yeah, well that's big. But if if you then leave, there's a there's an there's a space there. Yes, yes. For which somebody who couldn't be there now can be there. That exactly that totally happened. And people are like, oh, I finally get my chance to be, you know his right hand or woman man it's, um, a, it, it's a it's a fascinating thing so how do you as somebody who's clearly obviously still got a strong spiritual life where do, how do you i don't want to say i don't kind of make sense of that 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 something which can be so both both and in a negative way <laughs> and 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 how common it is there was a line i don't know who said it but somebody in the film said um look that you know it's codependent people and 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 pathological narcissists and there'll be a there'll be cults all over the place there'll be there'll be some in your town you know you may not and i live in glastonbury there's certainly some here and but but generally that kind of feeling of it's very common and and when i was thinking about this i thought you know so i was in that big cult for a bit I was in a smaller cult around a young guy who was a little bit older than me again, actually, who was very, very charismatic. And then I was the right hand man. And that was amazing. And then I left and then it fell to bits. And but I also was a, it, I was kind of in a political cult, I think, when I was all when I was young. 
which I got involved in because I needed to recover from the other cult, really. But looking back, it had all the same qualities of a cult. It was a mm. strict way to think. You were part of a group. You were special. You were going to save the world. Um, mm. You were lucky to know this. Mm -hmm. You gave meaning to your otherwise a life which I feared might be meaningless, perhaps, or you know, all those things. So it's, it feels like we're dealing with something pretty common and important to understand in some way, lots of ways. Yeah, I am. I, um, I um, when I, after I left the group, I, I've always been um, uh, a political junkie from, uh, from like I used to read the morning paper when I was eight every day until, you know, uh, no, loved nothing more than to discuss politics with the adults when I was a little kid. And so when I uh, left the group, I, I did get into a bunch of political activism. I, um, Interesting. I actually um, sued the state of Texas. I was a part of a national lawsuit and it scared the hell out of me when they sued me back. Um, <laughs> we, um, but we sued every we sued every state in the country um, to uh, have a verifiable uh, uh, paper trail uh, with our ballots, and it was like we we have a constitutional right to know that our votes were counted accurately because. <clears throat> Even if, uh, like with a computer voting machine, um, it can tell you that you voted for candidate A, but if you don't have a paper trail, the, the computer can just be programmed to be like 4951, no matter, even if it tells you. And so we were, uh, I got into that and, um, and a couple of other areas, but I, I think uh, after I left the group, there was a, like a search for greater meaning and yeah. purpose and like you know what do i what do i want to do um to leave a legacy you know yeah it's the legacy i want to leave yeah well that feels important to me too i i i, I completely get that and it, if and and I think that seems important. Did you in the in the in the group? Did you did was there a sense of was it purely internal? Was it just individual enlightenment, or did, was there was there an aspect that related to the whole world story? Or um, I think within the group, uh, we were we told ourselves the story, and the guru told the story that there were. Um, uh multiple masters you know enlightened people in the world but there were gurus uh that were ma uh, gurus for the masses um and then there were finishing masters and we were uh, master, and very that's why good oh, very we good were, you know so blessed to be in a community of a hundred people in such close yeah, proximity yeah yeah from, yeah uh, so yeah, because because with Maraji, his whole part of part of what pulled me into that, well, again the synchronicity. I mean, you know, I can remember I was at a some sort of drama course of a thing uh, that I was on as a kid, and my whole thing at that time was sort of profound regret that I didn't live at the time of Jesus. Ironically, given my work on Jesus now, but but <laughs> you know, it's like that was the thing. It was just to. Uh, to you know why wasn't i you know because then it would be obvious what to do you just follow jesus um so that when uh, a friend a new friend of mine brought me in this book who is guru Maharaji, and announced that he was jesus mm. and everybody <laughs> come again um uh it was like ah and then and then there was this there was this young boy. I mean, you know, he 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 was talking to two hundred fifty thousand people at aged eight, you know, and, and announced he'd come with more power and that he was going to bring peace to the world. And they're like, "Wow, great! <laughs> that sounds. I'm up for that." <laughs> and so the the incentive to get over the initial, who is that slightly overweight young boy wearing a bow tie, in that picture, 
that is spooking me out and they all keep talking about him like he's the lord of the universe i could get i think the part of the motivation to get over it was it just offered so much you know it offered this magical experience which i'd already had numbers mm -hmm. of times but couldn't get back to at will and these guys were going here's the meditation you can get back to it you can have that and it's like oh and so i knew that there was this experience so when they were saying there's the experience it's like yeah i know that so and it's like ah oh, great he's gonna give me the entry ticket and 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 he can save the world and i can i can cheer him on and how how, how lovely yeah that was <clears throat> um because I, I, I told you that I, I picked up the first copy of The Laughing Jesus like uh, three, four months after I'd left the cult. And I always thought that uh, Jesus was this cool, enlightened guy, you know, and he was just one of many cool, enlightened people. And um, and then his followers just fucked up his message and distorted it. And then I read that book and it was the first time that I was like, no, like, <laughs> which Occupant's Razor, which makes more sense that there were all these other dying and resurrecting God men <laughs> and, and they were all false, you know? Um, and Jesus is actually the, the real one, you know, and I think it, I think that's, I think that's because, you know, history is written by the winners. And yeah. that's the reason that we don't have uh, a show on the history channel called searching for the real Mithra, you know, because yeah. uh, Judeo Christian um, religion uh, won for lack of a better word. So, so isn't it interesting that we've got this kind of, I, I, you know, certainly it's obviously it's played out in my life, but I think I'm part of something more general of questioning Western religion and then kind of more general religion and thinking there's something experiential, something spiritual, supernatural in that deep sense of the word above nature, more than nature. And then being part of the really the tail end it was the generation i think before mine but i was part of it that brought in the east and mm -hmm. i was very influenced by ram das and all those people where they brought in all of this eastern philosophy and it seemed so good and and part of that was the void in the west that, that our mm -hmm. culture seems so empty of meaning so full of everything but empty of meaning and therefore looking to it and then here we are now having gone through these all, all of this stuff and being involved in these groups and all the rest of it, still trying to going, yeah, there is something here which needs to come out and it needs to be in a new way. And and so in some ways I feel like what's happened to me, the reason I ended up going, look, this triangle, which is really the whole Indian system of the enlightenment, the ego and the, and the guru. as like, no, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's the problem. These are bad ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, it feels like now now I've kind of I'm working my way through the east now in the same way I work my way through the west and mm -hmm. then what's left and what's left actually is really great <laughs> it's something very deep and and meaningful is left it, it's actually well, better I, I want to give a shout out to uh Ram Das uh, you know I, I be here now was like my first hippie spiritual book and blah, blah, blah. And then I got into the, uh, into the group and we would go out as a group and see movies once a week. And um, we watched Fierce Grace the, right. the film after he um, had, a had a stroke. And I, I was just taken aback by his uh, candor, because I don't think that um, Andreas would ever have the capacity to say, yeah, I had a stroke and I was terrified. And I, you know, was talking to myself and you're like, I shouldn't be terrified. I'm Ramdas. I've done all this spiritual work. I've done all of this, how, and, um, that to me was just such a beautiful example of of actual egoness 
egolessness, you know, yeah. that he was yeah. to be like, hey, no, this was, I'm, there's no pretense. There's no, and there's, that's, that's, that, that was the thing that would drive me nuts in the Buddha field, people trying to put on airs of like, oh, I'm, I'm going to become enlightened, you know, like, come on. Or the I, copying's really crazy, isn't it? I, I could remember just, I could remember that, because Maradi was, was young and Indian, he would say, he would speak English in his own idiosyncratic way. And then people who, as English as I am, would start copying the bad English. <laughs> so the experience wasn't inside of us, it was within inside of us. And you didn't comb your hair, you combed your hairs. Because <laughs> <And, laughs> yeah, everyone would copy this. But I, I want the Ramdas thing seems really interesting to me because, you know, I, I, I really love Ramdas for what he gave me. and. And and I had the chance to go and see him after his stroke in a few times, but um, in in Hawaii. And what struck me about what he gave me, I think, it was the same thing he gave you, was he gave me humanity mm. and authenticity. And yeah. yet he himself, you know, when I was at his house, has this gigantic picture of Neem Karoli Baba, who is just mm. like who is the Lord. And mm. so the very thing which I was going, oh, get rid of that. He was right in that. But he was a doorway through which to escape from that because hmm. he was able to be wise and human and vulnerable and himself and just went tim you don't have to be like that you can be just tim um yeah and he, he that was such a gift that he did <laughs> even though the, 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 you know they we're all kind of paradoxes aren't we yeah he uh uh i i I remember uh, reading Neem Karoli Baba's books um, and and loving his books. Um, Did you? I also, you know, who else was incredibly funny? He, I mean, he went a little mental towards the end, but um, Bhagwan. Oh, was very funny! Really very funny! Very funny! Really? Yeah, <laughs> brilliantly funny. He was the funniest. The first one that funny. I ever heard shit on Jesus. And it made me fall over laughing. He was like, yeah. I mean, he's riff on, on the cross and he's saying, why have you forsaken me? And he was like, that doesn't sound very surrendered to me. He was like, <laughs> I've never heard anybody criticize him. Just of and he, he, that very strange intonation that he developed, very strange, but really mm -hmm. kind of bizarre. Uh, yeah, very funny. And did, but, did you ever but, see but, his, um, his, bit about the word fuck yes it, i mean it's a classic and if anyone hasn't seen it they should go see it because it's just brilliant and they should watch wild wild west because you can just see where all that led at the same time and that it is such a you know how can and and what particularly upsets me i, I, I mean i've been around spirituality as you know since i was a kid you've been around it all your life most of it I don't like, you know, most of it's kind of, I mean, I mean, maybe that would be true if I'd been a plumber or a politician and you just become aware of the, ugh, about the world you're in. But I, I just like so much of it. And yet right in the center is something I absolutely love, which feels of such value. Um, and it kind of hurts me sometimes really that it's so, that this, this, mm, you know, that, that people can watch Wild Wild West or holy hell which are really valuable things to have out there but it also play you know it would be very easy to watch both of those and go oh dear look that's a whole load of people just a little bit gone a little bit crazy mm -hmm. and when people like me or you or you know talk about yes i had an awakening it's like well you know <laughs> have you been taking your meds or you know have you are you yeah. You know what's what's your you know what's actually happening there and all of that, and yet it feels like that knowing. But then when you've got somebody going, oh, I've got it, I've got it, I've seen the light, <laughs> and it's just like in that context, it's in danger of devaluing it because you just look at it and you just think, well, that does look a bit like it's a psychological fuck up. Um, yeah, but it's it's. I don't know. I don't know if um, if people just come into <clears throat> the world with um, 
certain tendencies or you know it's that getting back to predetermined or free will like why did i discover my third eye and decide that i'd really like to play with it you know i was like you know? um Stop and playing with your third eye great <laughs> <laughs> so um uh, you know not everybody has that experience but it was a real thing that um yeah, there, there's, I was not a great meditator. Some people really like to sit and formally meditate for hours. And I had more um, uh, intense experiences when I was doing like uh, walking meditation. And I remember going into the health food store and it was, it, I used to call it like the best was when meditation connected to you. Yeah. instead of connecting yeah. to me yeah i agree you walk into the store and all of a sudden my third eye just started throbbing just whoa, whoa. and the, and all of a sudden time slowed down and i was like in a different time whoa you know but i think i think part of that is um have you ever read uh, dmt the spirit molecule um I think I've seen a film of that name. I seem to remember. I don't. I haven't read the book. I don't think. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, within the book, they they talk about how our uh, we all create DMT naturally, um, and they think that it, uh, it is manufactured in our pineal gland, which is where our third eye is, and uh, the the thing that they were, um, or one of the theories that they proffered was that uh, when we go to sleep, like we've got, uh, we've got DMT and we've got DMT regulators and that when we go to sleep, um, the DMT is allowed into a more free form and that's what allows us to, you know, go to other worlds when we're dreaming that, oh. that it's actually the release of that, that molecule and that um and the other really interesting uh, thing about that was uh that perhaps people that have schizophrenia have poor regulation mm. of that of that uh dmt molecule that we all make mm. and so maybe the people that are um, schizophrenic just have too much free floating DMT going on. And so they're always kind of in a dream state. And I, I thought that was a really interesting um, uh, thought process. But yeah, if you're staring at your, if you're concentrating, it was like we were working out, you know, our pineal gland and getting it like to really activate. Um, so whether or not that means that there's a God or not doesn't matter, but it's a real experience, you know? So, so, so to just be, you know, just because it feels like I should do that, it'd be fun to do that. Where has it left you, Greg? I mean, you've, or the other thing, I mean, the other thing I saw is, I mean, you've, just, you, you've gone from being a personal master to the enlightened master to having millions of hits on YouTube for, for massage videos and things. That's phenomenal. So that's yeah, quite um, interesting. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know anyone who's done that. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, well, body work is. Um, I'm good at it. <laughs> I'm just. I'm not, I'm not really. Kidding. I'm good at it, um, <laughs> and I don't mind the stage. I'm actually going to try stand up for the very first time. I've never done original stand up. Um, <laughs> uh next monday on a big podcast um and we're going to talk about the cult and then i'm gonna um i'll i'll, I'll ruin the joke for you now but uh and then i was like but that's not what i came to talk to you about and i've got a couple of pre-jokes prepared and then i was going to go into um i came to really what i really came to talk to you about was jesus and and then I'm going to go down into a little squat, and I was like, so I was sitting on the toilet, <laughs> uh, swiping left and right because I'm single um, on Tinder, and I was like, Jesus Christ, how many people 
um, in the world today first met on the toilet. And that obviously it started making me think about Jesus and what Jesus would have thought about Tinder. And I was like, oh, I know. He would have swiped right on everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, but then I thought about my own personal experience more. And he did run around uh, in the desert with 12 guys. No, he wouldn't have been on uh, Tinder. He would have been on Grindr. <laughs> <laughs> that's a part of the bit but i thought you might enjoy a jesus joke an original jesus joke yeah my my i do i think my, i'm not even even been in 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 uh, how long is now but my my favorite my favorite one was a piece of graffiti which i just saw in town i think it was which just said uh, smile jesus loves you and then underneath but there again, Jesus loves everybody. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I, thought you were, I thought you were going to go. I saw a, a, a bumper sticker that said the exact same thing. And it said, Jesus loves you, but all the rest of us think you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good too. I love what the reason that one really, I really love that is because what you catch there is exactly the paradox, I think, of that mm -hmm. universal love versus you not anyone mm. you and that for me is this balance between the personal and, and the universal that seems so poignant and important and 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 that's the the spirituality i want to see come out of this is an um, you know away a with the perfect master finish with that completely like you you know if, if someone comes to town and they're enlightened i'm not remotely interested right that's mm. like thanks for telling me warning me in advance i don't need to go and mm -hmm. you know and and that's a waste of my time and a waste of everyone else's too and then but then that spirit of inquiry of human beings together looking for this more emergent level of reality and helping it bring bring it in that we're part of that and you know in a million ways you know the insights like you're looking at the insights there and just that constantly to to and the, and the, and that's the legacy bit i think there was a great, I like the meaning of you know, etymology a lot. I sit on the etymological dictionary a lot. And I was looking at the word success a little while back. And it comes from the same, because it came from the same root as to succeed, like your, your kids succeed you. And mm -hmm. it was lovely, really, because it felt like, yeah, that's it. That's what you're saying, like legacy. It's like you, you want to make the world a better place for those that succeed you in some way. Mm -hmm. to actually leave it there that that your journey has meant something even in the smallest of ways that uh it's better I, that that reminds me of um a, a story um where i hadn't I, I was i was transitioning out of the buddha field and um somebody gave me some lsd and i hadn't done any lsd in you know a decade um did you do any so uh, hallucinogenics at the in the buddha field was that part of it no no in the buddha field i i you know no mm -hmm. drinking no everything cane, yeah 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 so no red meat no wheat yeah. no yeah. dairy yeah um but i had this i had this moment so i, I hadn't i i take this acid and I'm in Carlsbad caverns and um, and I'm looking um, around and I realize that uh, this used to be an ocean you know that the, there were lime deposits and it was still forming and I got hit, I had this realization when I got hit on the head by a drop of water and I was like oh I just don't have uh, the time scale to see that this is actually still forming right now. Like we, I think of this as a, and then that got me thinking about um, how ultimately uh, nothing matters because everything is going to be washed away. And even if I was there at the um, signing of the Declaration of Independence and left a legacy, eventually, it's all going to be washed away and then but that moment led me to this beautiful realization which was like well if this moment doesn't matter then that means that this moment is as important 
as any moment that has ever happened before. <laughs> that if, if there is no ultimate meaning, then this just me standing here is as important as any moment that has occurred. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I certainly resonate with that. I think our lives really do matter. I think that's, that's the big thing I think was missing that led to all the confusion and things when I was younger. It's like, you know, that, that, that deep intuition that our lives generally, that they, that they, they, they matter. And the great thing that's missing in our culture is that, which is why my, my whole focus now and has been for a while is like, how can we find a new, a narrative that combines the spirituality, the supernatural and the natural in a way that's coherent because this narrative we've got in the culture has been absolutely unbelievably good at certain things and unbelievably bad at others. And it, it will move on. I don't have any doubt about that. It's just that how soon and when and well, what, what do you think is the um, uh, important bit to you to support the idea of, of um, like the Tibetan, like the way that you exit the world is um, the most important because I've, I've come to think of it as um, you know, going back to the Ram Dass thing that when we are coming to our moment of uh, death, that it's more like, we don't have to try to like, I'm going to be still and I'm going to, you know, be in Samaji as I uh, leave this body and instead be like, okay, well, I'm on a roller coaster and it's okay. Just put your hands up in the air and go, wah, here we go. You know, that's- I'm with you, Greg. I mean, I've been around death a lot. Well, a fair amount, both individually and professionally. And all. I, I don't know. I just think people who think they're going to be sitting there in meditation and they go, they have not been around death. I mean, it's just not like that. And a universe in which what matters is ha the state you're in when you at that moment just feels like, wow, what an unjust world that is. That can't be right. And, and my sense is one of the one of the ideas I'm I. I, this is very central to me now, um, is, is the idea that the past doesn't pass, that, 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 that it's actually the, the evolutionary process is accumulating more and more information. So that implicit in this is all our emails, meeting Teresa, you going in the Buddha field, me being with Marathi, all the things, that's all here. It hasn't gone anywhere. So I'm, mm. I, what's happening now is that everything that Greg's ever been is meeting everything that Tim's ever been. So it's all mm -hmm. there. It's nothing's lost, and and therefore it feels like well, if, um, as I suspect, um, death is not the end, then what what you take with you is everything, <laughs> and mm. what will make the difference is everything, and mm. that's it's it's the whole life, that's what mm -hmm. makes you what because that's who, not because because that's actually who you are, it's like you are your life. And mm -hmm. that lovely that lovely role that we play, you know, and that and that's the real legacy. I think that's the central thing: is you create yourself, you co-create yourself, not in some secrety way necessarily, but in in the very obvious way. Like you know, you chose to have this conversation with me. I chose to invite you. We created this, and it's now part of us. So now I'm in you. You're in me, and whatever else happens, that will always be there. It can't not be. Um, mm -hmm. And that feels that feels very deep and, and and redeeming somehow because then you can take all of those bad experiences and things which maybe were mistakes and they're part of you and then they become something which is positive so we've been able to turn some of those negative experiences you know especially for you a lot of years for you and something good arrives mm. from it and yet it's still there it's still part of you yeah and um you know we'll even after we die, um, the you know your books are going to ripple forward into consciousness, and these videos of like we're, we're going we're going to leave uh, a ripple uh, one way or another. Um, I'm of the belief that you know like. This used to be carrots and some 
bacon and some tree, you know, all of broccoli. Um, and that is, and this is going to go back into whatever it is and yeah. uh, whatever the spark was that animated this flesh sickle is going to go back into whatever energetic realm that that it was that it came from and so it's i don't know that i don't i don't believe in like a dude named god and i don't necessarily believe in i don't know what i believe but i i believe that it's fine either way because either energy never ceases to exist either just like matter doesn't and that energy is going to go back into that energetic field that it came from. And if I'm wrong about that, then I'll just be asleep <laughs> forever, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's fine, <laughs> just, we, yeah. I, I don't know, uh, what are you, are you still of the, um, I, I know that you hold your uh, beliefs loosely which is something I respect. Um, but are you, uh, do you think that there's reincarnation and that that's, that's part of the path or what is your? My, my, I, what I'm, what I, what I want to do is to, what I've been doing is developing a way of understanding those spiritual ideas alongside the current, the whole weight of, scientific ideas in a way that's coherent together and i do take those all those ideas seriously um i struggle with reincarnation because i've seen it abused so many times mm -hmm. but if you pushed me i'd still go yeah I, despite all of my reservations of seeing how it's been abused i still mm -hmm. think there's something there it's just that our current understanding the way we conceive of it makes it sound completely absurd Mm -hmm. um, but actually, I think there's other ways of understanding it which make it not absurd. So the, mm -hmm. the essential, I mean, we're, we're, there's too much to kind of launch into really as, as, as uh, the kind of end of the conversation. Yeah. But, but, mm -hmm. but the, the essential thrust for me is to take the, the very simplest idea is that, that this is the one in, re, in relationship with itself. And that's what everything is. Everything is the one individuated into all of these different systems in relationship with itself. And that, that process is an evolutionary one. And the, the thing I'm trying to make work is to say, what if everything, literally everything, is one process of evolution, one process in which uh, new potentials are being realized in every moment based on what happened before. And that's the whole thing. So everything. I liked your I, I liked your bit before. It's I, and I've said it many times, which was um, we're God watching God go by. Like that's that's how consciousness gets to experience itself. Because if there was no differentiation, um, you know, consciousness couldn't experience itself. It just yeah. Uh, just be stagnant you know yeah. and so everything is different the one is, is differentiated that's the mystery yeah. and somehow through that we've got to this place where it's arisen as tim and greg who are busy trying to work out what it is and and i and i and i mean that quite literally it just feels like look the universe has evolved into us and we are the universe going what am i and yeah. what, what, what's my do i have a purpose am i going somewhere is it do i mean anything we are that. Well, when you when you said the thing about trying to um, uh, interlock um, science and spirituality, um, well, science says that matter never ceases to exist. So this is going to turn into something else. But it also says that energy never ceases to exist. And there is some energy that animated this so it has to go it doesn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily mean that reincarnation exists but it does lend itself to you know we're going to go back into the flux we're going to you know that that we came out of on some way that we don't understand 
Yeah, I mean, the thing which the thing which strikes me is that if you take that, if you take the narrative, the modern mythos, we've had in this universe at least 14 billion years has got us through 10 billion years of the evolution of matter, 4 billion years of the evolution of life. And what's come at the end of that is the psyche or soul. And that's where we're hanging out right now. Most mm. of the biology and the, the, you know, the room's been just being room. My body's doing all the body thing. But all of the action has been taking place in the psyche or soul, which is non-material, which is non-local. So that, so that, that something, I, I, I quite like the word information, that the, 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 the oneness, the isness, the being of everything is being informed in all of these different ways. And it's arrived at this non-material, non-local level of information, which we're sharing now. So that I send you little noises, which you get biologically, but it's all going through electronics, of course. But actually, mm. the meaning is, where is it? It's like it's, it's in the psyche. So the idea that, that there is a realm, a non-material realm, a supernatural realm, seems to me undoubtedly true. And what strikes me about all the stuff around death is it sounds very much like that dream realm. And then when I, when I study the bardos and the Tibetan of the dead and all that, it just feels like, oh, yeah, a, a dream has arisen from the universe. And the reason that it can become dreamlike is because a dream has arisen from it. It's, a, it's evolved into a dream. And, mm. and that's where it's got the material element, which is not like that. And then over the top of it, there's this um, this dreamlike element, which we can go into in meditation or psychedelics or death or sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it can affect this. I think that's the big thing is is breaking that the, the reductionist idea that it's all coming from the bottom up and going, no, 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 <laughs> it's all it's all affecting each other. And those synchronicities that we talked about right at the start as a, as a natural phenomena is when the dreamlike quality of life dominates. And if you go into these groups and you focus on it and you use your intention to bring it out, the whole thing can become very much like that. And, and it's, then you really see it and, and you can't, I mean, the, the, the other thing I haven't got into it, but I mean, the other group that I was in, in probably for no more than four, 12 months or just a bit more, which we formed ourselves, was so it was like being tripped out we weren't taking anything we were completely straight we, we, alcohol was okay lots of cigarettes i seem to remember but <laughs> um but nothing hallucinogenic and but it was it was like walking around i mean and and, and not just like we i mean utterly utterly unbelievable bizarre stuff that would happen every single day hmm. and 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 i had to recover from it because it was so extreme um, and that's where you see this this dream is so strong now that that we need to take it seriously. And that's what science fails to do. It just fails to understand this, that there's another level after biology. It just cuts it short because it can it, it can only use its method on this on what can be studied with the senses. And therefore, mm -hmm. it, its its answer is to dismiss what is actually the most emergent level of reality, which. Yeah. Um, and my hope well, is that what we'll get in the future is that people will take both seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um, that, that's one of those <clears throat> uh, tough ones to like my uh, my cousin um, was the one who got me into the group and he went off to India and did the full wandering sadhu thing with a begging bowl and um, meditated in the caves and um, and he would tell me these uh, amazing uh, experience that he'd have um, but I would sometimes get annoyed because I, I, on the one hand I would be like well you I believe you you have no reason to lie to me I know that you did that and that was your experience. But I have a hard time when people say I had that experience, therefore it is true. Yes, like, that's the key. True is that, it, that, that's the getting older, isn't it, Greg? Is that the getting the older, I just feel like you realize it can all be interpreted in different ways. So even the waking up experiences, I now interpret them in a different way. Mm -hmm. And 
so that what happens when you're in one of those groups is that there is somebody who, who interprets it for you, who tells you the, the, the lens through which you see it. And you think, I see this all the time with when I'm being critical of things like non-duality, and, 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 which is something I have been involved in, but never quite critical of. People think that the way they're interpreting it is the thing itself. They just can't see that that's it maybe a right or a wrong interpretation, but it is an interpretation. Mm -hmm. getting that makes all of the difference and yeah. i was thinking earlier you know when you talked about neem karoli baba i mean i remember reading neem karoli baba's stories and reading like i don't know the things with um the uh um your um yoganda and all those books mm -hmm. and you know what what i find amusing now i just believe them. Mm -hmm. I believe the whole thing yeah just went, oh, yoganda was so dry <laughs> and it was just like you know just that that these things were outrageous that were being said mm -hmm. but now you know i'm much more likely to go well maybe or maybe people wanted to believe that or maybe uh, there's other things going on here or you know i'm much more skeptical about things when we were talking about um justifying and like overlooking stuff uh, there were times where i was like uh the guru was completely irrational and being like what are you are you you're out of your fucking mind like what what is going on but then you would uh read ramakrishna yeah and he would be flailing around on the ground and blah 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 and i was like okay well maybe that's what it's like to be enlightened and maybe this is all just a lesson for me and i just need to ignore the guru's um literally like what like <laughs> yeah I, I can, I can, you, you I, have to create you you create a a a, a compartmentalization yeah to be yeah. like okay well he's not rational but i'm not enlightened crazy wisdom yeah <laughs> yeah i mean reading zen stories you know the, the body dharma's first disciple cutting off his arm and and reading that and thinking, wow, not going, whoa, <laughs> you know, you thought you thought Scientology was bad. This guy yeah. <laughs> cut off his arm, but that's Zen, and they do crazy shit, right? And 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 it, it's a kind of a mindset whereby you don't you switch that off. I'm, I'm a, I I love doubt. <laughs> and by the way, that is one thing. Like, it's one thing if you were uh, born into. Um, Scientology or you found something good in Scientology and you're still in it but how does anybody join Scientology now with all those documentaries like, it is, <laughs> like how, how do you how are they still getting new members when there's like well I wonder I wonder you know how many people who are involved with whatever he calls himself now um, yeah. have seen Holy Hell or yeah. there is there's a question I want to want, want. There is one question I want to ask you before we before we um, disappear off to our lives, but um, which I was thinking about with relationship to all this, and I didn't really have this because what, it was different for me. But I was thinking about it with Andrew Cohen's cult, and which was different again to what you were into, I think, but had some similarities. And one of the things which was the same is I think that you know very very devoted good people creating something amazing mm -hmm. and in their case they had a fantastic magazine and so, i mean just amazing what they did and you know you could see it on holy hell you know there was, there was a there was a really beautiful experience and, and, a, and a closeness why do you think in those sort of cases it's not why 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 when when the when the when the senior students which seems to be the key when they finally go on mass no why they don't carry on why don't they just go look we're just going to get rid of this pariah but there's something mm -hmm. in here we've been doing together which is really good we don't have to dismantle everything that's good here we just have to but actually people need to go off and find their individuality in some way it looks like yeah i would uh, i i i would say so but there was also like once um uh the guru is exposed for not wearing any clothes. Um, 
that's it's literally in this case. <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, oh, dear. That, uh, uh, where was I going with that? That um, you know, there there are people. There were 120 people, and uh, most all of them. If I see them it's a it's a giant hug and hello and nice to see you and i still run into people from time to time but within 120 people you don't necessarily like everybody in the group of course and without the the guru being that cohesive thing that we're all going to like uh, it isn't yeah. like we could pick a, a meeting and yeah. uh vote a new you know this or that um if the only way that, that I think that happens is if um, he had died before um, right. what happened was exposed, right. and then and then right. the group goes, okay, we're going to turn this into a religion, you know, and we're going to yeah. have. Uh, and and then, by what I can see, that's when the civil war starts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a crazy mixed up world, Tim. But I'm uh, I'm super grateful that we got to talk. And um, yeah, your 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 uh, work changed the uh, the course of my life, and um, and uh, I look forward to actually meeting you in person sometime. Hopefully, that would be lovely, wouldn't it? When this crazy COVID thing is done. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Um, and uh, it's been, yeah, been really, really lovely experience to to explore all of that and try and make okay. some sense of it. Well, if uh, you ever um, get a canceled guest and you need the last one, just send me a WhatsApp. And if I'm free, we'll do it again. Fantastic. All, all right. right. God bless. Well.